We're getting there. Oh, she's an interesting picture, Peter. <laughs> well, they weren't all rapid, but there'll be some editing going on on this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if people have comments to make um, as we're going through, just pop them in. Matthew says he can hear us okay. So if you pop them in the comments, and I'll interrupt Peter as we're going along, um, and we'll hand over to Peter. Right. Well, this is uh, going to be interesting for me to see if it works. Um, I've been, been on the River Ash for half my life. I would have thought literally half the hours of my life, possibly. Uh, I always used to think, how on earth did somebody invent this machine out of the blue? But I have to be impressed by the guy who did it, or did he? And I'm going to throw some things in the air because I don't really know, and I don't think anybody else does now. There are a couple of people who were in the background at Paxman's, and I think they put an awful lot into it. And then there's that um, person who doesn't really have a very good reputation at Rowan Glass, Mr. Couchy. He was the man that signed up all the drawings. But anyway, what we'll do is wander through a ramble to see how Henry Greenley got from where he started to designing the Ravenglass and the Romney engines and having a hand in the Martins engines that are encapsulated in our chamber of Spain. So Henry Greenley, loco designer, about 1900, he was designing something like this. One and seven eighths inch gauge, so it isn't even a standard gauge model. And yet uh, the Apogee of his career, he was designing these splendid machines. And even with these 15 inch gauge machines, the difference between this little giant and Typhoon in the background is just so dramatic. You think, well, how on earth do you go from one to another? And even aside of that, the man was designing all sorts of machines. Sometimes they would be. <coughs> scaled down replicas of the full-size engines. And sometimes it'd be his idea of what a full-size engine ought to be, a Canadian engine or a heavy goods engine or whatever. And the, the sense of proportion that um, I admire. And the particular thing about most of the engines that are attributed to him um, are still capable of running. So that in itself is something remarkable. But behind and underneath our engine that we're looking at today, River-esque, we've got something that really is the beast that makes it work, the boiler. And that particular boiler actually has components of the original, the 1923. Uh, the back end, the firebox, was renewed in the 1960s. And... Uh, that really does show what goes wrong if you don't look after your water treatment. In the 1970s, we got indiscriminate water treatment at Rogan Glass and the firebox on the engine, barely 15 years old, started suffering and it was condemned just over 20 years old. Similar boilers on the Romney engines going round and going round again. So, you know, there's a hint to everybody do look after your water treatment. Well, Mr. Green was primarily not an, a hands-on make-it engineer. He was a thoughts and how it works engineer. I'm not denying that either side have a, a priority, but he thought, wrote it down, drew it out, and he put two people his ideas. And his first idea for a 15-inch gauge engine, this is a supplement to that, book that he wrote back in about 1904. This is his idea for a, an estate locomotive. Um, looks a bit jolly, would have had uh, a sort of scale appearance, uh, obviously a bit tight for the driver, he's bum six over the back, but it has got a better boiler than a Haywood engine. It's not a uh, box standard loco boiler, but it's one of those bullhead boilers uh, that more uh, modern uh, 
launch boilers have where the firebox is bigger than the boiler barrel. Um, and one never got built, but never mind, it was obviously intended for Blakesley State Railway that was just being built to take coal to the gas producer plant or the electric generating plant at the hall and entertain people on the way. And it's motive power, obviously. We, I'm going to throw things up that will be hoary old pictures to many people, but put them together, I hope, in a challenging way. Uh, and Greenlee was interested in these things because the Americans, the Cagneys, were producing these like things came out of fashion. God knows how many they were made, hundreds. Um, nobody successfully worked out. Um, many still exist, still run, there's three in this country, They're game little things, but little. And uh, they, they survived because they were robust and people rather planted them. But Mr. Bassett Lauk, uh, Greenlee's associate, wanted something and thought there was a market for something different. So they were. So they, they cooperated in the design and the construction of Little Giant, the little engine that's down in the hall below us. And uh, here it is on steam trials at Eaton and the Eaton Railway uh, before it went to where it was due to work in Blackpool. Um, fair old load on the back, you can add up, you know, it's on the bitter wagon and uh, it managed to pull them. Now, Greeny was not satisfied because the wheels were too big for pulling heavy loads. It was a light bath machine. Uh, and the other thing that was wrong with them, the file door wasn't very big. They built two with a very tiny file door. You could barely get your hand to. And after that, all the engines were put with a, a big hole to get the coal in. And the great thing is actually, Little Giant survived. This is its first visit to Ravenbus back in 1965. And uh, the lady on it, a lovely lady, or was then, that's Eleonora, Greenlee's daughter. And she was very much involved in the design of things. She would draw them out. And later on, she and her husband, Ernest Steele, kept up the Greenlee uh, family tradition of designing and supplying drawings and that sort of thing. But if anybody would say what Greenlee's character was all about, well, he's got a bit of mixed history because he fell out with people. And actually, she's a lovely lady, and one rather suspects if you met him, he'd be a great guy. If you got the wrong side of him, possibly it was that was the other side of it. And to be quite honest, the people who seem to get the wrong side of him, um, the ones who made him bankrupt in the end, actually are less sympathetic characters. So my money's on Greenlee being, you know, if you met him on the engines, you'd have a good chat. However, the little things they produced, these little giants, as I say, Greenlee wasn't satisfied with the design, but it was a good workhorse. The ones eventually that went to the Rill Miniature Railway, 1911, uh, went round and round the big lake. You only had one engine to start with. It worked all season. It didn't break. And actually, it gave the people later at Ravens this idea that these things were indestructible. But Great little workhorses, and the only thing that they changed with them was bogey tender, more water, or dog, need a dog. You could have a dog on an engine on a 15 inch gauge train. Uh, but the general arrangement was a worker. Um, but Greenlee was involved in all manner of things. So, you know, he did what somebody came up to him and wanted designing, Buffett Larks wanted lots of little engines that the Germans could reproduce in their factories. They could make seven and a quarter, nine and a half, seven and a quarters out the factory. And here is one being tried out. This is the seven and a quarter in Immingham. And the gentleman on it turns up in our story later on, that's Sir Aubrey Brocklebank. He uh, didn't live then close to Raven Vassal, although the family had taken over Erden Hall. He had his own house at Nunsmere Hall near uh, or Mantwitchy area, top end of Cheshire. And um, he did have his own seven and a quarter line somewhere. And the money's actually on it being Lumsmere, uh, where it ran briefly before the First World War. But he was a hands-on man. He, he was 
later chairman of the his own shipping company and then Cunard when they were taken over. And he was a director of the Great Western and I think the uh, Suez Canal Company, but he could drive engines and probably could make them amend them as well. But the Green News, as I say, was interested and involved in doing all manner of things. And 15 inch wasn't the core to either his business or his interests at this time. Um, his business and his interests developed because he wrote and he produced this monthly journal from the mid 1900s to just after the First World War, model railways and locomotives and a monthly journal stopped full. So, you know, anybody who's had anything to do with writing and editing will know that is a demanding thing to produce. And it was a two way thing because he needed information from people and he liked to give it out to them. And you start to see the influences that weren't apparent otherwise, particularly developments in America, miniature railways, these next few shots are things that he would only know about through correspondence. And people did, you know, what's happening here? Let's put it in print. And he would promulgate it around. This is the East Lake Park Scenic Railway and a John Coit, the guy standing there with the ball hat, he designed these and you look at them and they're getting on for the size of engines that we in the 15 inch gauge world would recognise as chunky beasts, capable of going, look at the wheel profile, looks all right, look at the rods, you know, these people know what they're about. The boilers are odd because they were different ones were oil fired so maybe not needing a proper loco box the same as we would expect and here other engines that he designed were involved on a railway at a seaside resort near san francisco called venice somebody had determined to uh, dig some canals in the coastline and put property around it and try and develop it for entertainment purposes with an 18 inch gauge railway round the houses and round over the canal bridges and for what from about 1906 to 1926 it was a real public attraction and it was uh, there, were, there were troubles with it internally always try to bother with organizations the people who owned the site didn't get on with the man the man decided he would um, take the injectors home they sued all sorts of problems occurred, but the actual railway carried on for 20 years until motoring took over. Here we see it in the middle of the town square at Venice, where the train would turn round, fill up. And as I say, it was an immensely popular attraction, but look at the size of the machine, big and chunky. Look at the train behind it. It's the sort of train you might see, imagine behind one of our locos today and uh, they just ran and ran and kept them going. Now this was an incredible railway put up for an exhibition. It was the Pacific Panama Exposition in San Francisco again, uh, at the opening of the Panama Canal in 1915, or was it? I can't remember anyway. Um, a, a, a gentleman, called Louis McDermott, who had uh, his mother's money behind him, decided he would run a railway around the site. It would be a railway, 18 inch gauge again, four big Pacifics, a little 060 shunter. Uh, the exhibition had 19 million people and the railway ran around the site, uh, not quite as busy as they'd hoped for. I think they lost money because the conductors uh, half inch some of the uh, takings. But the railway ran, incredible situation, there it is running along the coastline for part of the exhibition site. And the amazing thing is these machines, the ones we saw in the previous pictures and these have survived. The ones that's here um, were eventually gifted to a university, Cal Poly in California. And amazingly, they've only just survived one of the severe fires that ransacked the site. 
Um, there is a bit of an issue at the moment of step who will restore them and so on, but they have survived. And as you say, the drivers sat inside. There's a clue. And exactly contemporary with something that's nearer to heart. I mean, some of these pictures are pictures you've seen before. Though. David will tell us about the man at the, uh, the back of the train who appears in and disappears. But the relevance of this is, this is August, early September, 1915. Greenlee's actually upset his friends. Um, he, he, he wrote um, a less than discreet uh, editorial blaming uh, Mr. Bassett-Lark for importing German products. It became a bit of a dinger. And so Mr. Greenlee didn't come to Ravenclass for the next five years. It's significant that although his machines were operating, although he was interested, and he must have had opportunity, he didn't turn up. Instead, he observed from afar when the little engines that he'd been involved with at uh, Stoughton Manor Pacific, John Anthony, built for Captain Howie, and Katie were both acquired and came to Ravenglass. He kept up with the news, he, the opening of the railway from Erton Road in February 1916, and the busiest day they'd ever had over the Easter weekend, ever had on the little railway in its three foot gauge days. Um, tremendous time with double headed trains running with the two. Bassett Lark uh, scale model engine, San Spirel at the front, and John Anthony Colossus behind. And a tremendous time was had by all. Meanwhile, uh, as I say, Greenlead upset his contact Bassett Lark, but he got contact with friends in Germany, even though you know the two countries are at war. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that social contacts are broken. And uh, Hare, Roland, Martins had uh, got Greenlee to design. I can't work out absolutely who built this one. I've got it that I know somewhere. But you'll smell that, although this is a half inch scale to an half inch village, um, it looks like an engine that we already know. So it's one of Greenlee's features that at times he will have a style of an engine that's his. And you find, for argument's sake, um, something that looks like the Canadian Pacific on the Romney, and a 12 inch version, and a seven and a quarter version, and even smaller. And they've all got that similar family feel. But at that time, he was writing comments on the railway operation at Raven Glass. It was new, and they're obviously trying to um, keep the services going, running on the uh, steep grades. Um, they'd set out with the idea that, that, yeah, the amount of maintenance you need on an engine that's been running equivalent around the lake at, at Rill and have given no problems, so I'll give it some one in 40 gradients going up and uh, one in 40 gradients coming down, you might have a different maintenance bill. Well, these were Greenlee's ideas of engines that might prove suitable. And although, you know, they look a bit bizarre perhaps to us with Stuart's background with the engines that run at, um, at uh, Kirkley, or sorry, run at Kirkley's articulated machines. Well, you know, the best in your have them. Um, they probably would have been quite interesting. Well, the proportions are interesting, the size of wheel, size of cylinder, size of firebox, you know, five square feet of great plus. Um, the only thing is for the engine driver, keeping your feet under the ash pan would keep your toes. Um, and Greenlee's other ideas of um, a model 15 inch gauge goods loco where the wheels could be dropped out with all the valve motion tacked into them so you could actually jack your engine up at the corners, do the repairs, lower the engine down and keep it on its way. Again, a five foot square grate. So, you know, he's got a feel for what you need to do something. And this was a suggestion that came into print Later in the war, for some other reason, this is a proposal for a 15 inch gauge machine to do real work. And uh, well, it showed Northern Rock a thing or two, didn't it? Uh, four, and a half, four and a quarter tons of weight, uh, 
God knows how many tubes in the boiler, and look at the great size. Um, it's, a, it's a hauler. Meanwhile, though, he did get involved in another scheme. This is by the end of the war, and he still hasn't been back to Ravengrath, or sorry, ever been to Ravengrath. He hasn't really got in touch with his old colleagues, but he was involved with the scheme to extend the Sand Hutton Railway. This is our friend uh, Sinolda, running with Sir Robert Walker before the First World War. Um, there's a Russian court delegation on the train there. But after the war, there was a scheme to extend the railway at either end, down to the main line at Wars Hill, across to farms at different places, an agricultural railway. They got something that they hoped would work. I mean, what it didn't take account of was the amount of second hand vehicles and people were trained to drive them that would hit the roads after the war. However, it was a, it was a good try to try and improve communications and this particular design was Greenlee's approach to what could have been operating on it. Found apparently in the Northeastern Railway offices in York and signed Henry Greenlee, a design for fairly big. You know, look at those wheel sizes, cylinder sizes. It's it's a river-esque with a, lots of funny bits. And as I say, you could keep your toes warm bad weather but you could protect yourself the idea of sitting within the cab so it's an overscale machine getting towards the third scale that we now talk about on quarter scale track and of course it never took off did it the uh, costs of building new compared to acquiring second down war department sorry ex war department material and of course the line was a rapidly regaged to 18 inches and took over a totally different thing. And Greenlee's other contact at this time was um, with the people who, the fairground people who run the real miniature railway. And he designed a, an upgraded locomotive for them. I mean, if you put it next to Sonolda, or you put the drawings alongside Sonolda, the Class 30 Bassett Nog Atlantic, well, they're pretty much a spit image apart from the rear truck of the engine having inside uh, axle boxes and the wheels outside the frames. And these machines, the Albion class, John was the first. This is John, the later one. And they have trundled around the real site from that day to this. Now, the um, interesting thing was that there were proposals to do things at Ravenglass um, on a different scale to what had been running before, sort of. And I'm sorry I couldn't find the uh, copy of a drawing that somebody sent me. This is a sketch of the drawing. But in 1919, in print, there is a record that somebody was designing a 282 heavy goods locomotive, and it was emblazoned river-esque on the side. But when you look at the dimensions, um, the style of the thing, it is very evidently a different sort of engine to the river-esque we know today. It has a lot to do with the uh, newly upgraded machine that's being built for the railway. And the man who claimed responsibility for it is sat there in the middle of the picture. That's Mr. Couchy. Um, with, we think, the Johnson brothers, who again were involved in the uh, railway development and railway operation on the practical side. Uh, Mr. Couchy had organised at the end of the war, getting the poor Sansparel down to Hunts, his local firm in Bournemouth. You know, everything's done locally, isn't it? And they rebuilt it and then later carried on with building uh, the new 462, which was um, going to be named Sir Aubrey Brocklebank. Uh, I'll rattle through. You've probably seen pictures like this before, but this poor Sans Farrell, probably 1918, because the further track is in situation of boot, and uh, 
it was when the railway was still trying to run a daily service there and take iron ore out of the mines. Uh, now, Mr. Couchy was involved in all sorts of things, but we're not able to pin too much down, apart from the traces of letters that he sent when, when they rebuilt cottages at Delgarth. Uh, and built a washout over the drain and the drain wasn't big enough for the number of people who were going to live there and blocked up. There are some wonderful um, surveyed letters in, in the archive of Whitehaven. Now, Greenlee hadn't shown up at Ravenglass, but 10 years after a gang of them had turned up at Rill, he turned up with that gang they sort of had a reunion at Ravenglass at Easter, 1921. And uh, there's a Mr. Proctor Mitchell there, Mr. Bassett Lauk, and Mr. Greenlee. And they all turned up and had a whale of a time. Um, they had the Sir Aubrey Brockle Bank up to Delgar, sorry, Delgar's, the cottages, the station at Delgar, as it then was, in I don't know what fine style. There's a record of it in the article he wrote for the um, model engineer magazine and they turned it into the railway's first guidebook as i say they had a wonderful time i think they got on the handle drove up and down and uh, greenly admitted he would really got a thing about ella he thought that type of engine was going to be quite the thing to, to cope with keeping the railway operating however um a few trips out on the other, much as if one had a few trips out on the Katie at the moment. I think it was the uh, horizontal oscillation or whatever, it shook you up. And of course, other people at the time uh, reported that um, if you had a regular trip on the Haywood engine, you didn't need a laxative. <laughs> as I say, they turned, I couldn't buy my copy of the 1921 guidebook, but they threw it into the yellow 1923 version that we know and love and that Dave Jenner reproduced later. This is an original looking sad, but it is actually owned by somebody who bought it in 1923. Um, now, just to bring things further into what we started off talking about, which is River Esk and why Greenlee got involved. Well, having visited, He's dragged in, sort of, not to the railway operation, but the peripheral operation, of the quarries that were going to be developed alongside the line. <coughs> the uh, Beckfoot quarry had been operating since middle 1880s, and there was now a project stimulated by Sir Aubrey Brocklebank, as he then was. Um, he got a sponsorship for effectively for a local cooperative that involves two local families, the Hollands and the Nortons. Yes. Yeah, thank you, David. Um, in the Beckfoot Quarry Limited, but he supported them and they were going to take quarry material down the line uh, to an intermediate crushing point. Initially, the quarry was for um, <clears throat> uh, set making, that was a skill of some of the quarrymen, carving square, well, I say square, oblong box out of this hard granite. It seems an impossible task to be set, but that was a, the, the, the prospect for the railway until they could introduce a crushing plant and then grind up the stone and make railway ballast, concrete, road stone, whatever. What's on a better version of this picture is that just out of sight in the top right hand corner is not just a Hayward engine but Sans Perel out as well and they wouldn't just send two engines out for no reason that must have been an interesting day with those two paired up pulling this lot on a regular basis to shift several thousand tons of stone down the Murthwaite to build the stone embankment and contribute to the concrete works that were being erected for the crushing plant to be. And Green had been brought in by Sir Aubrey as an independent to both design the equipment for the uh, crushing plant and provide 
a locomotive to haul the trains up and down. And this is one of the earliest sketches of the new locomotive that Greenlee was involved in. I haven't got a name on yet, but we can imagine it was going to take over that river-esque name. Um, the layout of the engine has one or two revealing things, including the bell gear stuck on the outside, generally reckoned to be Greenlee's version of uh, the hay, sorry, the haywood type bell gear. But the important thing is somehow sitting within the profile of the cap, trying to give the driver some protection, the opposite of, of what was on the Haywood engines. But Greenlee had his office at Ravenglass. He's sponsored by Sir Aubrey Brocklebank in some way. There's family interest in that uh, apparently would go and turn up at Erton Hall and the servants wouldn't know whether to bring him in through the uh, servants exit or whether he was posh enough to um, not spoil the carpet in the front <laughs> hall. But we don't actually have too many clues. The next thing though is that the engine is turning into, uh, what should we say, a more finely detailed machine. And here, just one or two things to point out. It's the Goods Locomotive now building. This is the illustration from the yellow guidebook. But also, look at the wheels. On the uh, driving axle that the main coupling rod, sorry, Conrad sits on, there's quite a deep um, balance weight. And the other balance weights are much smaller. And that's as engines are conventionally built to balance the weight of the main rods on the wheel that's going to generate forces. And the other note is that on the cylinders, you've got Davy Paxman's patent valves and valve gear. Well, uh, I will illustrate this with another, this is out of Paxman's archives. And uh, to me, actually, this is a lovely engine. The chimney, it's obviously river-esque, isn't it? Because it's got all the technology, but um, it's got a, a slightly deeper chimney, slightly different cab, and a six wheel tender. The six wheel tender would have been in the bum because you haven't really got a bit of a much of a footwell. But if you observe the cross section, the vertical cross section, you can get some idea of what went on. On the second driving axle, there was some mechanism that drove rocking arms into behind the cylinder and drove the bow gear arrangements. We actually don't know why it went to Paxman's. Um, it's reasonable to assume, and in fact, there is some Paxman um, publicity of the 1980s that goes back and says, well, it was probably because Sir Aubrey Brocklebank, with his Cunard connections, had um, machinery for the ships. But there isn't anything that literally firmly ties them up. Uh, either side of the River S being built, there were refrigeration machinery. The, the, the company was uh, doing all sorts of machines, but it did have an angle on a particular type of valve gear and pop-up valves for the cylinders, which were initially built for high-speed stationary engines for electric generating and things like that. Um, this is their device for driving the valve gear on Riveresque which they were hoping to develop and push out for mainline use. Um, it looks like a cat's cradle, but actually what there were were two eccentrics either side of a, a middle bit. And the middle bit could angle the eccentrics. They didn't just sit firmly on the drive shaft. It somehow, uh, sorry, it was able to angle them. And that gave you the valve movement on the push rods. You see the big picture here at the bottom, the valve rods that came and ended up rocking the spindle across at the cylinder. And there were poppet valves, lifting valves. And at the time, this was quite innovative. Uh, the aim was to reduce uh, both steam wear, sorry, steam consumption by having a, an efficient valve gear that didn't leak and wear and tear on the valve gear because there was so 
little back pressure on the rods and things. Um, <clears throat> we will know later because at some point the um, uh, the bell, uh, sorry, the the history of the engine will show that this valve gear wasn't particularly effective or useful, but we can leave that for another time. As I say, Paxman lengths were mainly devised for stationary engines, but they did sell something like 60 sets of valve gear to the LNER. They sold 40 sets to Spain, some in Holland, and one set to the Great Western. This is an engine called, I can't find its name, Cayman Court, and it ran until 1948 with the Paxman setup. However, the engine was being built when somebody came a cropper. Uh, the somebody who was supervising construction initially was Mr. Couchy. And in dealing with the engine, he signed off all the drawings. Mr. Greenlee's name isn't a them at all. And then suddenly on the 19th of May, he's been super, well, transposed, should we say. It yeah. might have got something to do with the fact that he just sent a letter with his card to the railways inspector, dying to, what should we say, um, upset an apple cart. The files in the public record office of Kew have a thick file called Dangerous Working on the Eskdale Railway. And it starts back when the three foot gauge line was being uh, told to stop running. It went through the period when they tried to revive it. It went through the period when they did open up with the 15 inch gauge tray having sent uh, an innocuous letter, not quite explaining what they're intending to do. And back in 1915, the railway inspectors suddenly realized they dropped a wallop and um, they'd allowed something to happen that they didn't want to. But Mr. Couchy was onto this and upsetting apple carts. And as I say, he was um, rapidly sidelined. But he had been doing something to do with the engine quite a lot. And the splendid thing is that his drawing set has survived. Somebody's acquired it. And uh, we hope it can be part of an exhibition about River Esque that's held here. Now, they were a bit uncomfortable about what to do with all the bits of this engine because it was so much bigger than the engines that were going to, that had run before. So they, Panic, will, you know, will it fall over? Will we be able to see out the front if we sat underneath it? They actually made a, a lino and also would almost construction, pushed it up the line on a wagon to check what could be seen from the cab of the new engine. And uh, as anybody who's written on the engines today would recognize, they more or less did something that you could sit inside, especially if you're just a bit slimmer and less tall than modern people. Finally, the engine got put back together, um, <clears throat> the chassis and everything assembled and trials started. Sorry, what I forgot to say was that Mr. Greenley only got to see the engine on the 8th of June. So he, he actually wrote down later, he, he only saw the engine when it had got beyond the stage where he could attend to all the details and um, then complained that these were the things that he would have sorted out had he been there to look after them. One of the things was that they didn't sort the balance weights, they just cast one set of identical wheels and they were all the same size and that proved to be a problem for later. But eventually by October the engine was more or less ready to go out of the door and run those greenly with the team. Again, there are all sorts of sad things. And one of them is that the pictures that remain that have been in print, this is from Eleonora Steeles, um, don't seem to have survived uh, for us to access. I mean, David's shaking his head there. Um, they're out there somewhere, perhaps. Somebody can't have disposed of them, but um, this is sad. The things that have survived, though, are the uh, records of the tests. Uh, they ended up 
in the railway journals of the time, um, evidence of inequalities in the distribution of steam. I'm not going to point them out here, but the lumpy bits that indicate the steam pressure in the cylinders should be more evenly distributed, uh, i.e. side to side on the two different cylinders and front to back on the two cylinders. So where you see disproportionate shapes of, of recognizing the um, pressure of steam in the cylinder, they should not quite be identical to each other, but the nearer that they are, the better. And this was obviously part of the problem. But Greenley was stuck in doing all sorts of other things. He'd been at the same time as finishing up the whatever was required on the River Esk, all manner of little details. Um, his old associate, Mr. Bassett, though, wanted something else, which was a small engine to fight off a challenge that engines boiling water by methylated spirits were no good. And a new up start who reckoned that engines, even as small as one inch gauge, could be burning coal in their fire boxes. And Mr. Lawrence, who traded later as LBSC, and they had a competition at the 19, January 1924 Model Engineer Exhibition between Mr. Bassett Lark sponsored Mr. Greenley's designed Loco Challenger, and as we referred to before, 282, very familiar looking outline, although this one's got a middle cylinder. And then finally on the 18th of December, 12th of December, it set off on a wagon from Colchester, 18th of December, unloaded and run up to the engine shed. I think it was about the 22nd by the time they got on their first trip to Erton Road. And then they tried the loco out in the quarries. Um, <clears throat> yes, well, it did the job. It pulled the loads, but there were issues. It was a bit finely built for wandering around the rough tracks of the quarry. And uh, I remember a story from Bert Thompson saying, He'd gone away on holiday, been its first driver. And when he came back, young Bob Hardy, who was given the engine, was in tears because he slipped, climbing the bank up behind the crushing plant at Merthwaite and uh, slipped back down to the passing loop at Merthwaite, what's now the quarry. Um, <clears throat> so the loco had technical problems. Um, these inequalities in the uh, distribution of steam meant that it might take a bit more steam to start moving, but then when it did move, the ports would open, there'd be more steam in, the wheels would pick up, and uh, that was one problem. The other was a ride problem. It shook and damaged the buffer beam of the tender, and uh, eventually they needed a new set of wheels. Uh, <coughs> Um, sorry, immediately it needed a new redesign of the valve gear on the drawings that exist as a redesign that was dated only a couple of months after the engine first took place. But nevertheless, its specification was to come into Ravenglass with 25 tonnes of train of stone and turn round and take 150 passengers up the line without hesitating. Protect the driver during the winter, make steam, and it did. So I'm going to stop on that score in a moment. But the other interesting thing is when it came, what colour was it? Well, somebody recorded it as a greyish green. And the other thing that hasn't been recorded is it had a white cab roof. So I hope that if anybody needs to make a special effort this year, the white cab roof might take off. Anyway, what I'll just refer to is it's going down to Romney. And uh, I, I found a few Romney pictures. Uh, Lucy's dad, somewhere out there, posted these, and they're absolutely lovely. And I thought they deserve to be up for um, uh, my colleague here to take note of. We um, went to the Romney for the Paxman Jubilee in 1985. It was the jubilee of their two Axman engines, the Northern Chief and Green Goddess. 
Um, and we actually had a bit of a sideline role to start with. Um, <clears throat> we to go down to Hive and pose around and the two Romney engines took off with their train and they did a non-stop round back to New Romney. But then we were coupled on the front of them and set off with 27 carriages and the two locos behind us and steamed off. George Barlow was my pilot man, he's there on the engine. Uh, I said, uh, do you want to drive, George? No, I'll fire. Said, right, yeah, okay. So he kept the needle on the line, the water up in the top, and we set sail and we had a fine old time. We hadn't gone very far when uh, we'd actually got to the Warren. But coming out past the Warren Bridge, the uh, River S was putting smoke into the sky and the other two engines were strangely quiet. And Andy Mills, uh, sorry, yes, it was Sutty on the Northern Chief behind just waved quietly at me. The exhaust coming out of the Northern Chief was non-existent. Mr. Batten on the Romney, sorry, on the Green Goddess at the back, equally non-existent. I said to George Marlowe, is this a put-up job? Theatre, lad, he said. Theatre. <laughs> We're not going to do this again. <laughs> so there we are, thundering, I don't know, somewhere bottles, I think, thundering off the uh, off the willow. We I said, We're not going very fast. You could see oh, they're on the track. But never mind, it pulls the train. I believe myself that there wasn't, we'd better get the two other participants to um, corroborate this. But it, 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 it pulled them all pretty well to uh, Botolf's Bridge through there. We actually had a bit of a struggle coming out of the Prince of Wales and they joined in to get us into high. Anyway, a splendid time with the Paxman and do support it this coming whenever we can and Brian when he's down there. So you might know more about the River Esk than you did to start with, but do think of this, we all, don't really know. Once we get past River Esk onto the Romney engines and the, uh, the German engines, yes, but the secret behind Northern, sorry, behind River Esk, who had a hand in it? Well, Mr. Couchy must have had something because he signed all the drawings off and the proportions of the engine are very much a Muriel with a proper boiler. Um, there was a chief draftsman and Mr. Manning. I haven't even heard of to find out his Christian name. And an Albert Howe, he was uh, something to do with the Lentz gear and he went off to manage the Lentz side of things before coming back and being a senior man. And you rather wish that you could have been there sort of 40 odd years ago, maybe before that, before he died, to just ask him. Anyway, thanks for this evening. And I'm sorry it was a bit uh, constrained to start with, but. We had a good deal out of David. Well, don't dispute me uh, yet, Peter, because there are some questions. Oh, questions. And bits. Oh, 19 inch gauge. <laughs> um, do, 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 do. Um, let's just go up there. We're getting some 1960s stock to all oh, We sorted that out. <laughs> <laughs> and Murray Tremelin, who uh, was up at the weekend visiting, has mentioned. That and it might have been in the 1955 shed picture, which was in Dave's part. You could see a basset rook coach in the doorway. I think there were two at one point, but I don't know yeah. when the two went to one. I think the one in the doorway is the one because the end kicked in. We don't know why, yeah. but that ended up at Beckford right. in, in pieces. Yeah. Um, the other ones got repainted in green and. We're still running. In the 1960s, yeah. <laughs> and then Mike has mentioned there, there are two painted Hayward tops, but into Peter's bit, um, Nigel mentioned he could see the northeast crane in the background, which was the Cheeseman one, wasn't it? Mm. Mm. Um, and Mark Pye asked, in the picture of Eleonora, who was the man with her? That's her husband. That's, that's Ernest. Ernest, Ernest okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, um, Eleanor was, was really lovely. She must have been 80 something and she would reminisce 
I had a pleasure of driving, well, how can I put it? I got to drive Green Goddess in a Haywood Society special because Richard was tied up at Romney. Ever get lucky, you know? And Eleonora would come on the engine and was reminiscing about having to stay in front of Mr. Bassett Milk in the offices at Bassett Milk. Careful, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't make any more comments than that. But there was a twinkle in her eye because she obviously stayed in. <laughs> um, and that's 1914, the Panama Canal. 19 inch canal, I believe yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. And Matt asked, were the Sutton engines um, green leaf? Well, they sort of were because well, they, they bought, they bought boats, didn't yeah. they? Yeah. So they're nominally a class 30 with Great Western ish bits on. I mean, Greenlee got very possessive about some things because he claimed the Sir Aubrey Brockle Bank was his design. He also claimed that the um, German engines in print were his design. <clears throat> um, but then he disowned anything to do with River S. <laughs> He's never put in absolutely all his lists. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just as a nice aside, um, well, Nigel's trying to get some green leaf gold gauge blueprints, but he also mentions that the Paxman family went into building French farms. <laughs> They're incredibly heavy. Um, and he's worn out too, but he's got one that he's probably not going to wear out. <laughs> and, um, and the Andy Nash on this train. Andy well, Nash I'm glad we out. stayed in front of you, Andy. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, my my uh, promotion to driver took rather longer than I'd hoped, but there you go. Um, <laughs> if I could I can recreate it next weekend, Andy. What? Yeah. I've got 17, uh, yeah. 27 coaches. Oh, I don't know. Peter, Trevor here. Just before I dash off, that was fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, just little giant, though. It was with us in 1964. Was it 65 for its... 65 was it for its first uh, visit? I, I've only got, I never saw it that time. It was, right. um, but I no, think it was, okay. it was just, just, just a slight aside, of course, that when you're talking about the scale, quarter scale and the third scale, of course, was that by the time Little Giant got to us and it was very war, a bit worn and tired. And of course, our railway was worn and tired. It wouldn't <laughs> stay on the track, would it? So. Mm -hmm. It, uh, it fared better much time round in the in the photos that you showed. Hmm. But the, the wonderful thing about what Glynn's work, you know, that we all yeah for. But yeah. The time we got to nineteen eighty one when yeah. we had our cavalcade. Um, the little giant got all the way around the railway. Yeah. Because yeah. The track, you know, there's enough new rail gone in. Yeah. Wear and tear on the old stuff could be kept on top of. Yeah. So you anyway, do. fascinating. Thank you very much. Nice to speak. Yeah. 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 Good night, all. This Good night. Yeah. Good time, yeah. So, Peter, I think. Little yeah. Mike Decker. <laughs> Matt, oh, go, Mike. What would you like to say? Well, when I designed the Pacific for Milwaukee County Zoo, I went the Greenlee route with oversized parts and more or less out of scale and they managed to run it 17 years without wearing anything out seriously hmm. gents i'm sure most of you are aware of this book can you see that miniature world of henry greenley we'll stop the screen share um, oh sorry um, some of our, our younger viewers might not know this book <laughs> <laughs> can you see that miniature world of henry green i've just looked on on the flea bay and you can get it from three to about six pounds but it's by the steels and it's well worth a read yes a lot of back man i've also done some other searching while we i have been watching i assure you um <laughs> in in our marshlander magazine in 1974 there's an article by Nigel Whitburn, who's now the chairman of our heritage group, about the Santa Fe. Where's the camera? I can't look at both. 
the Santa Fe miniature railway. I can scan that and send it to you if you want to have a read. And the other one I found was George Barlow went on his travels after he retired and wrote a, an article on the Venice and Overfair engines in 19, hang on, blow me up, down, left. Does that, does that show? Mm. We can just you can see the writing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the locos are in a shed looking rather forlorn. Oops, that way. But there was a picture of him driving. Did he go with Chris Finken? Um, hang on, let's have Something a look. Something like that. Possibly. Um, when Chris was involved with the model railway. And he also had a 15, uh, 15, he had a seven and a quarter inch railway that ran in a couple of locations at New Romney as well. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I'll, I'll get those scanned and sent off to you. If you want to see them. That'd be really good. Thank you, Andy. Yeah. And last point, um, I'm sure <laughs> you know, um, Rip, not Rip Rest, Count Louis is also coming down to the gala. So um, trying to work it out, we think it was 1981 the last time it visited. Ooh. So that would be quite nice. Are you, are you coming down, Peter VZ? I hope to see. Um, good. It was a good run out all the way around the railway and fitting on the turntable at Hyde. Mm. Yes, there's that picture of the two engines, isn't there? Giant. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And actually, running at Romney speeds, the wheels were just going mm. around at the right motion. Mm. You know, they're obviously designed for that sort of sprinting speed. Yeah. 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 Presumably, you rise up a bit like uh, aquaplaning, you rise up above all our bumps and just take off. And <laughs> Very good. Very good. I just missed George in California on his 18, 1980 trip oh, by fine. a month. We well, were out there <clears throat> visiting. He was going to be there in a month to uh, take the engine back for the visit. Fern, I think it was. Mm. Yeah, One he... of the Redwood Valley engines, anyway. He certainly traveled a lot. Much more once he retired. I think he, he virtually could have got a Californian passport. But <laughs> <laughs> well, if anybody's in contact with the Redwood people, they should pass on our regards because they were great fun to be with. Excellent. Well, we'll wrap that up there. Um, we will be back first first day of June. It might be it shouldn't happen to a local driver. Um, or it may be something else we never know um, but as ever thank you all for watching and uh, if you've not been on YouTube to see what we got up to last weekend there's plenty of videos there to go and have a look of Katie and Northern Chief being very very noisy and it's worth a look at that as well so on behalf of us all thank you and we'll see you all next month okay bye now thank you bye. Bye.